Okay, so we're going to start out, uh, one of the themes here is this, we want this to be an interactive session. So we're going to start out with a question. And this is a fundamental question in research is what is your hypothesis? So how many people here have been asked that question? And how many people here have asked that question? So that is just fantastic to see because that really is what we're building this whole enterprise around is, uh, is hypothesis generation, hypothesis testing, and it really is fundamental to what we're, going to try, we're trying to accomplish in research across the field of medicine, but especially in emergency medicine. I was asked that question once when I wasn't prepared for the answer. And this was when, in 2007, uh, at what turned out to be a fairly historic meeting when leaders in emergency medicine met for the first time with the director of NIH, Elias Zarouni. Uh, and this was after the 2006 uh, Institute of Medicine report on emergency care. And we uh, were, were able to have a meeting with him. And one of the things, after we sat down and talked about what we wanted to do in emergency medicine, he said, what is your overarching hypothesis? And we all looked at each other. <laughs> and we, in, in retrospect, were very embarrassed that we didn't have an answer. Uh, so I think that uh, in following that, we, we came up with a, you know, a hypothesis. And really, that is um, early diagnosis and rapid treatment of acute illness or decompensated chronically Ill chronic illness improves outcomes. And, and that's a reasonable hypothesis for emergency care research, but it still is inadequate. Uh, much of what we do is well beyond that scope, including prevention, the important prevention work that's being done here, educational research, uh, research in operations, and, and health services research. So even at, with that challenge, it's hard to define uh, what emergency care research is, but it still needs to be hypothesis-driven in, in what we do moving forward. And that's really essential to our mission of creating the future of emergency care, which is what we're uh, really driving towards here at the University of Michigan. So today we're going to celebrate research, and we're going to celebrate the work that's being done, and also the purpose of this is to bring people together to learn about what each other is doing and, and develop synergies uh, and really strengthen what we can do moving forward. So thinking about uh, this, and when Rebecca and I were talking about how we would sort of pull this together, it only seemed fitting to uh, name this research forum after really the founder of our department and a leader in the nation and interna internationally in emergency care research, our own, our own Bill Barson. Uh, Dr. Barson uh, came to the University of Michigan in 1992 as section chief of emergency medicine uh, under, the division, under the Department of Surgery. And then while here, established the Emergency Medicine Residency and a formal Department of Emergency Medicine in 1999 and served as the inaugural and only chair until 2012 when he convinced me to come here <laughs> uh, to, uh, to, try to, to try to fill his shoes, which has been a, has been a major challenge but a great uh, opportunity and, and honor. Uh, and so, you know, e even just for his work in the department, uh, we wouldn't be here. But but you know, furthermore, he really is an internationally recognized leader in emergency care research. Uh, he has spearheaded uh, the progress in, in clinical trials in emergency medicine research, worked directly with the NIH to help establish the Neurologic Emergencies Treatment Trial Network and then become the PI of the Clinical Coordinating Center with that, which really is recognized as the premier uh, emergency care research network in terms of clinical trials in the country. So in addition to that, he's been doing work in making the, the clinical trial operation better than it currently is. The standard, gold standard of randomized clinical trials we've grown to learn has significant limitations. And his work uh, with others in adaptive clinical trial design to figure out how we can actually optimize our trials, make them more efficient, and have them give us an answer regardless of uh, whether the trial is positive or negative is really an important, innovative uh, uh, achievement moving forward, and it's really going to uh, transform what we do in clinical research. And in addition, he really is uh, recognized as he, the, for the past two years now as the most uh, highly funded NIH investigator in the country in emergency medicine. So we are just blessed to have someone like Bill here st still in the department uh, and uh, still contributing uh, greatly to the field of science in emergency medicine. But individual success really is not uh, the only thing to, 
that is important. And actually, all of our careers are limited. Uh, we're uh, for, here on Earth for a finite period of time, and, and mentorship really uh, amplifies any individual's impact uh, and the uh, ongoing uh, success of their efforts. And, and, and Bill has been a tremendous mentor uh, for the people that he's uh, come in contact with. Many of those people are, are, have become leaders in the field. Many of those people are here with us still, but many have gone on to uh, become leaders elsewhere in the country. And again, what we're about here today is that interaction of our residents and medical students and young investigators and senior investigators in a way that we can mentor each other and amplify any individual impact uh, that we could have on the field. So with that, uh, just it's important to recognize that we would not be here today without the vision and leadership of Dr. Barson, and we're looking forward to hear uh, what he has to say in our keynote address for the first uh, annual uh, Barson Forum on Emergency Care Research. So thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, it's always kind of embarrassing to, uh, for something like this, but I, Bob, thank you so much. This is it's an incredible honor for me. Um, you know, I think back on, um, you know, coming here in Michigan, I was still 41 years old. I don't know why I thought I had the uh, audacity or cojones or stupidity <laughs> to come here and think that we could do something like this at the University of Michigan. But um, Peter Forster is here as my partner in crime, and Ron Mayo, who's probably the only other, and Steve Kronick, some of the original people who were here when I got here. But um, yeah, it came, I think the success of the department obviously comes with the people. And I think as, as Bob knows, part of leadership is that it isn't you doing the stuff a lot of times. It's trying to get really good people who are really smart and give them the resources and then you turn them loose. And when you've got great people like we've had here at the University of Michigan and, and a number of you in the, in the audience right now and some who have left, um, it's, it's so tremendous, so rewarding to see the kind of success that you can get. And it's all from, it's all from the, the people who are doing the work and not really from the leaders. And hopefully we break down some barriers and we run some interference and we get people some resources, but it's the people who really make things work. So I would like to thank all of you for that. Also like to thank my other partner, my wife, who married me the day after I graduated from medical school, a little over 40 years ago, who stuck with me the whole time. And although she's not here in the audience today, um, definitely wouldn't be where I am without her. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about something that's been near and dear to my heart for a long time. Um, I'm going to say a few words at the end about developing a successful research career with some credit to John Younger and Scott Van Epps for, for some work they did. But first, I want to talk about the elusive promise of neuroprotection. Uh, what have we learned and where do we go next? And this is something I'll talk a little bit later about in my own career. And Bob, I know, is somebody who talks about this a lot, and it's perseverance. So just to let people know that you know, a lot of times you fail. We've submitted a transformative science award to NIH twice on this area. Still haven't gotten it funded, but we're, we're still going, and we will do more. Uh, neuroprotection can really apply to any acquired neurological position, and it uh, condition and it talks about trying to prevent the injury that occurs uh, after any kind of a neurological insult, be it stroke, TBI, global brain ischemia, et cetera. Stroke and TBI have probably been the most studied areas uh, in this, and basically uniformly neuroprotection has failed. So in traumatic brain injury, there have been uh, over 20 late phase two or phase three trials. All have failed to show a benefit. The latest one that failed to show a benefit was one we were involved in in the net which was looking at progesterone for TBI. And interestingly enough, there have been more than 130 monotherapies that in preclinical trials look really good. They do a great job of curing rats and uh, sometimes larger animals, but don't work in people. And in ischemic stroke, about 15 drugs have advanced to phase three clinical trial testing, and all of those have failed. And Philip Scott and, and others in the room have been involved in, in some of those studies too, and it's very disheartening when these things don't work. Multiple drug classes have been tested, both in the preclinical and clinical phase, and I won't go into all the details about these, but basically, uh, although a lot of them, all of these have looked uh, promising in the preclinical phase, none of them work when you get to people. 
So why, in stroke, in stroke in particular, why have some of these trials failed? And there's a lot of potential reasons for that. Uh, they might have been tested too late. Great example, and this is something that really got me very interested in adaptive designs, is that when we were looking at the TPA trials, there were about four TPA trials going on at the time I was involved in the original NINDS study. The other trials all failed. The NINDS study worked, and it was mainly because we, you know, the people who were, we were working with had the foresight to treat earlier. And if we had not treated earlier, if we'd had a different design to the study, that would have failed, and everybody would have said, gosh, it's really too bad we don't have a treatment for stroke. But you know, fortunately, the study was done right, and, and we now do. A lot of times you might have had an inadequate sample size to detect a treatment effect. Uh, sometimes, depending on the types of patients you had in the study, you know, patients who are going to do well no matter what you do to them aren't really very informative when you're looking at a trial where you're trying to improve outcome because their outcome is already going to be good. And on the other side of the equation, patients who are going to do poorly no matter what you do uh, aren't good to have in a clinical trial because it doesn't matter what you do, they're going to do very poorly. So there's really a sweet spot in the middle and sometimes knowing who those patients are is very difficult. Sometimes the side effects were, you know, the problem. Sometimes did we get the wrong dose? And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Or duration of treatment. And a lot of times we pick these fixed trial designs and if you pick the wrong thing, the study fails. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So what's the typical model? How do we go about this? And for some of you, this is old hat, and for some of you, this might be new stuff. But basically, you talk about you have to have discovery research that goes into you know, very basic stuff, looking at pathways, mechanisms, different things that are going on on the cellular level or, or the genetic level to, uh, to have effects. You Then looking at preclinical animal models that actually have the disease of interest and trying to apply some of this discovery research there. And when you get into human trials, you talk about phase one, phase two, and phase three. So phase one is sort of like toxicity, pharmacokinetic testing. Is this really safe in people? Can you give it? And how much can you give safely? Phase two trials are the ones that should be pivotal. And those are ones that we're looking at safety of the drug in the, in the condition of interest. And you're also trying to get some evidence of potential efficacy. So might this stuff really work in the, in the clinical trial? And then phase three is what's called confirmatory. So that's a study that's set up to say definitively this works or this doesn't work. So what do we usually do with these phases? Well, in phase one, there's tens of subjects, usually not very many. It's usually first use in humans, maybe with or without the target illness. It gets you some dosing and toxicity information. So really nothing in phase one usually about efficacy. Phase two, one to a few hundreds of patients with a target illness, uh, you get some initial information about dose response, maybe proof of concept, side effects, and whatever. Uh, and then phase three, you hopefully get the idea of what are the real promising agents in phase two you want to take to phase three. And in phase three, you're trying to confirm superiority to new treatment. And according to the FDA, you need two, quote, adequate and well-controlled unquote, clinical trials in order to get a drug approved by FDA. So what are some of the challenges in there? Well, in the phase two phase of doing clinical trials, sometimes there's a wide range of dose strengths that might be the best possible dose. But the way we currently do trials is we choose fixed trial designs, right? You choose one dose, one duration, or whatever, and sometimes we don't actually know that. You may need to consider combinations of treatments or maybe different durations of treatments. You may not know the right patient population. I talked a little bit earlier, and Bob and I have talked about this a lot in cardiac arrest, some trials we plan that not all cardiac arrest patients are the same. Some have had more severe insults than others and some less severe, and trying to tease that out and knowing where your sweet spot is is very tough. And most phase two trials are really underpowered phase three trials. So they really, the way they're done, it's really, well, we're going to do this and maybe we're going to see a trend that looks like it's positive. And I can tell you there have been so many positive phase two trials that fail in phase three. It just happens again and again and again. And then there's no way of comparing different agents successful in phase two. So a lot of times in, uh, say, in the net, We'll be looking at a trial where we're looking to do a confirmatory phase trial. Let's say there's drug A, drug B, drug C, and they've been had phase two trials. They all look safe, they all look potentially efficacious, and they've all been done a little bit differently. And so you're trying to figure out, well, which one of these things do I really do to take to phase three? You have no idea. And so it's, it's guesswork. In terms of the right dose and stuff, we've had some interesting um, 
experiences with that. A lot of times what we do right now when we're working with trial investigators to try to develop these trials is say, okay, well, tell me, do you know the dose? And an investigator I worked with not too long ago who's actually doing a big randomized trial right now in Canada on something. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, I know the dose. I know the dose. I said, you're really sure? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know the dose. I, 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 there's really no doubt in my mind. I said, okay. So then we get to a point where we call anticipated regret. I say, okay, well, let me, let me posit this to you. If you do this trial that you're going to do in Canada and it fails, are you willing to walk away from your drug and say it doesn't work? He said, oh, no, I'd use a higher dose. <laughs> okay. So phase three, a lot of times we still don't know the right dose. I and mean, sometimes we still don't know the right timing of treatment. Like I mentioned with the TPA trials, nobody really knew, right? And we just assume that, well, we're going to pick a time and say that that's the time we're going to do it. You don't really know what to expect in the control arm because what happens in the control arm is really important. So let's say that overall treatment of a condition gets better during the time you're doing a clinical trial and your control arm, instead of only 20% doing well, 30% do well. Well, it can be a problem. You may not know the right patient population and you don't know anything about rarer side effects. And there's not too much to do about that. But Traditional statistical approaches that we usually use, and you go ahead and you go to your statistician, you say, okay, give me my power, give me my p-value, here's my hypothesis, you know, whatever, and what do I need for a sample size? The, you do these in a fixed way prior to enrolling the first phase three patient. And, you know, I can tell you this, it's not just in neuroprotection, but in so many areas it does not work. And so the number of failed trials you get is on the order of 70% or more. And we should be able to do better than that. So, you know, is this model broken? I, I think it is, personally. I think preclinical testing, some of this is being fixed. Um, typically done in single labs with individual models. And so somebody's looking at a stroke model and there might be five different ones being done in five different labs. And they're doing their own thing and they all look a little bit different. But it's hard to know how those compare when you're comparing a drug that used one model and somebody else got another drug that used another model. You can't compare agents from different trials. Usually people don't look at different agents, they look at one, and they don't look at how it compares to other things that might be out there. You usually evaluate one agent at a time. Some of the preclinical trials, although this is being fixed with some of the new NIH rigor requirements, in the past, a lot of times these preclinical trials were not blinded or randomized. A lot of times used outdated statistical methodology. And I know from talking to a lot of laboratory researchers, um, obviously none, none included in the room, but some who would say, oh, yeah, yeah, I figure out what I'm going to do with my trial, and I get everything all set, and then, and then I talk to a statistician, and I say, you know, give me, give me the power and the p-value. That's what I need to know. Uh, and the models they use might not be clinically relevant, and sometimes the outcomes are not clinically relevant. In the phase two trials, we usually don't have adequate data from preclinical trials to know what is the most promising agent. So if you're going to do a phase two trial in people, and let's say somebody's looked at drug A, B, and C, all in different models of stroke, and they all look pretty good you know, in those different models, but how do they compare to each other? We have no idea. And so trying to decide what should go into the phase two pipeline is really difficult. Again, we usually only evaluate one agent at a time. The outcomes might not be clinically relevant. Study designs are not comparable for different agents, et cetera, and we're guessing on so much stuff. And they're almost always underpowered for efficacy. So when I'm somebody who does primarily phase three clinical trials, I'm not able to predict who's going to succeed and who's not. And so it's, it's a real problem. It's a real problem to try to figure out what you can do. And in phase three, we're, again, still evaluating one agent at a time. We don't really know if we're evaluating the right agent because it might be that drug B or C, which we didn't choose to, to study, might really be the right one. We use these fixed trial designs. We guess at the dose duration and timing. Sometimes we get the wrong patient population, and we end up with a very high failure rate. So if you're not depressed by this, you should be. Uh, I am. You know, is the model broken? I think that uh, I think a lot of parts of the model definitely is broken. I think we get errors compounded by this outmoded process. I think we choose the wrong agents to test very often. We don't compare multiple agents to each other, and we often don't identify the right dose duration or timing or the right patient population. And so this is a really scary part, is that all these failed clinical trials for neuroprotection might not be that the stuff doesn't work. It might be that we didn't do it right. It's a failed trial design, not really a failed trial. 
And that's sort of a little bit daunting because, you know, I talked about all these agents that we've already studied that have all failed in clinical trials, and I'm not sure we don't need to go back and study them all over again and do it right because we didn't do it right oftentimes the first time we did it. So that is, that's something that is very daunting. Combination agents, you know, I think, gosh, years ago when I first got involved in stroke research, I know people would talk about, you know, probably the only way you're going to be able to do neuroprotection in stroke is by some kind of cocktail and looking at some different things that block different mechanisms and whatever, but we, we still don't do that. In rare circumstances we do, but for the most part we don't. Usually prove efficacy of one agent alone, then we move forward in combination. It's not logical to me anyway that blocking a single pathway to, will lead to improved outcome when you have all these un, other injury pathways that are active at the same time. And I think examples from cancer treatment are very instructive in cancer and HIV. So if you look at any of the, ret the individual antiretrovirals being used for HIV alone, they don't do that much. But in combination, they're incredibly effective. And so if you had just done the HIV trials like we do in our protective trials, you would say, well, we're, you know, people with HIV are really in big trouble because, sorry, none of these individual agents work. And they don't work individually, but they work in combination. And so some of, these, some of this can be solved by, or at least get to a solution by the, some of these adaptive trial designs. And adaptive trial designs are really very different. Um, so there's really a clarity of goals that you go through in the philosophy of adaptive trial design. And it's really a proof of concept versus identification of a dose to carry forward versus confirmation of benefits. So there might be different goals in the study. So sometimes the goals of some study, and I'll show a short example of one that Will's very familiar with, is not necessarily um, to say does the stuff work or not, it's to say what's the best dose. It's a dose finding study and that is the purpose of the study. The purpose of the study is to find a dose. What you do is you take frequent looks at the data and data-driven modification of the trial, and the design is adaptive by design. So this is all done before you start the trial. So this isn't that you start doing a clinical trial, you get the results back, you look at them and say, oh, you know, I can see this is happening, I need to change this. You have to identify this at the very beginning. And so you, you get smart people in a room together and you talk about, okay, what are the likely things that might confound us here and what are some things that we might want to build in adaptive strategies for? Let's say dose. Do we know the dose? Well, not really, okay, so we wanna figure that out. Do we know the duration of treatment? Not really, we wanna figure that out. Uh, how about the patient population? Do we really think it works in people over 70? Not really, we can figure that out. So you look at some of these things that you think might be a real problem and you design the study ahead of time to adapt for some of those things. And then you use uh, computer simulations to sort of fine tune the clinical trial characteristics. And these are just some comparisons of uh, some of the things, uh, comparing flexible or adaptive designs to traditional trial designs. And there's a lot of different things. We use very frequent interim analyses with adaptive trials, and that's to change some of the uh, randomization rare, uh, ratios often. Sometimes we use what's called response adaptive randomization. So it's not a straight one to one or two to one randomization, but you might start putting uh, unequal numbers of patients in different arms, depending on how that arm is performing. You might have many arms in an adaptive trial design. We've got one that uh, Grant, we've got under review right now, a TBI study where we have uh, 10 <laughs> arms in a trial. And that can, be, that can be very confusing sometimes. Most of these are usually Bayesian and not frequentist because they work a lot better. And you really control your error rates by doing extensive simulations. So there is enough, these are so complicated that you can't just have a formula like you do with a regular trial to say, you know, here's my power, here's my type one error. You really have to do it by simulation. So you simulate the trial 10,000 times, okay? And you say, okay, out of the 10,000 times, this is how often I have a type one error, and that is your type one error rate. So it isn't, it isn't a straightforward calculation, but you're actually performing many simulated trials to get an idea of what that might do. So the definition is making planned, well-defined changes in key clinical trial design parameters during the trial execution based on data, and it's gotta be planned, gotta do it a priori. The criteria have to be very well-defined. There can't be any fuzziness in that. And you really want to use key parameters, um, not minor inclusion or exclusion criteria. 
So I'll give you an example of one of the things that might work with. Let's say we're, and we've had this in some of the trials, let's say we're looking at a study and we think, you know what, anybody, I, I really suspect that anybody over 70, because the outcome in this disease is so bad, and usually people over 70 do so poorly that they're probably not gonna respond, but we don't know that. So what you can do, let's say, with an adaptive design is you can start enrolling people over 70 in the, in the design, and as these analyses come up, you, you will do these analyses and you'll specifically analyze the group over 70. And if it looks like the, their, their, the way their outcomes in the trial look different from the patients under 70, i.e. a poorer outcome where the patients under 70 are having a better outcome, then in the middle of the trial you can say, okay, from now on we are no longer enrolling patients over 70. So you're enriching your trial population, you're changing it, and you're more likely to get the right answer because you're focusing in on the group that's most likely to respond. But you're not eliminating that possibility at the very start. So the adaptive process sort of goes like this. You do data collection with your initial allocation sampling rules. You analyze the data. If you met a stopping rule, you stop. If you don't, you keep going. You revise your allocation sampling rules, et cetera, continue data collection, and this just goes around and around and around until one of two things happen. Either you hit a stopping rule or you hit your maximum number of patients. And either one stops the trial and then it gets analyzed at that point. So why would you want to do these? If this sounds complicated to you, it is. It's very complicated. It takes months to design one of these things. And we've designed, how many of these have we done now, Will? Like seven or eight? adaptive clinical trial designs. I don't think we've gotten the process down to under like four months. I think that might be, I don't even know if we've gotten down that low, but it takes a while, huh? We did those ones overnight. Though. Oh, we did those <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's a different story. Those were very rough. <laughs> it's to avoid getting the wrong answer. I don't want to get the wrong answer. You know, I spend tons and tons of hours. I've been doing research for a long time. I'm getting near the end of my career. I really don't want to spend what time I've got left doing things that are dumb and where I'm getting the wrong answer. I want, I want to do a study that has a reasonable chance of success to, and that at the end of the study, even more important than that, even if the study doesn't work, I want to make sure that when we're done with that study, if it doesn't work, anybody with a brain can look at that and say, you never want to go there again because these people did it right, the stuff doesn't work, move on, let's go to the next thing. And you can save resources and channel them in di different areas. That's really what I want to do. And I want to avoid taking too long to, to draw the right conclusion. And we've seen stuff like this happen again and again. So I was on a da data safety monitoring board way, way back in the 80s on a study called NASCIS, which I think all of you probably know about, even if you don't know the acronym. And that was a study that looked at high-dose steroids in patients with spinal cord injury. There were three NASCIS trials, right? And this is what happens when you don't do the trial design right the first time. So NASCIS one, they did, it was a fixed trial design. They're like, oh, well, you know, we probably just should have done this and, you know, whatever, even though the trial didn't work. And so let's just so say they did NASCIS two, and then NASCIS two didn't quite work right, so they did NASCIS three. And, you know, tens and tens of millions of dollars spent all these patients who are being put at risk to get in these clinical trials, you know, because you didn't do it right the first time. And uh, so it saves time, human subjects, and resources. And, you know, there's, I think we have an obligation to the patients that we treat, you know, to make sure that we're at, when we're asking somebody to be enrolled in a clinical trial, that it's a well-designed clinical trial and that their, their, you know, willingness to participate is, is trust in us and trust in us that we're doing the right thing. And I want to make sure I maintain that trust. The other thing I talked about earlier is avoiding anticipated regret. So a lot of confirmatory trials fail despite promising learn phase trials, which I talked about earlier. And so a lot of times what happens is that investigators can anticipate the design decisions they would wish to take over. And this is what, similar to what I talked about when I talked with a guy about, you know, what dose, do you have the right dose? Yeah, 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 except I'd use a higher dose if it doesn't work. But we, we asked those kind of questions at the beginning. Okay, we're getting this design together, and we, we're, what you really want to get to is a design at the end of the day, so even the person who's an advocate for this treatment, if you've got the design right and you ask them, are you willing to walk away from this at the end of the day if this trial is negative, and they'll say yes, because I don't think there's any stones we've left unturned, or for the most part, with you know, very high probability. 
So these areas of anticipated regret are really where the promising targets are for adaptations. Um, and so that, those are really the things we try to focus on when we're working with people to design these things. And I think that one can only understand what one can simulate. So doing these simulations is incredibly helpful, and not just with adaptive design. It's really helpful to do these simulations with just regular frequentist trial designs as well, because you learn a lot of stuff. And you can put different assumptions in there. I, I talked earlier about, you know, what if the treatment gets better for patients in the control group that used to have a 20% outcome now has a 30% outcome? You can do simulations on that. And you can say that I'm going to say that the, the control group's uh, outcome is going to improve by 10% over the five years we do the study. And I, I can run, you know, 5,000 simulations to say my current trial design either works or doesn't work if that happens. So it's really valuable stuff to know if there are some of these things you can uh, understand, you can simulate. And I'm not going to go into detail on these. These are adaptive strategies that one might use. Frequent interim analyses is almost always one of these. You can do what's called longitudinal modeling. I won't get into that. Response adaptive randomization, I'll show you an example of that. And uh, some of the other stuff that we already discussed. So this is an example of why I think an adaptive trial design is a smart thing. So this is a study where let's, let's say this isn't what this is, but this is a study, let's say we're looking at three different doses. And we're looking at the 12, the 24, and the 48-hour dose, okay? And so in a traditional fixed trial design, this is with 900 patients, you'd treat 301, 300 in the other, and 300 in the other, right? And so this might be the result you get with the error bars, okay? Here's the problem with this. Could you say, what can you say about the right dose looking at this study? These are some things that, that might show, right, in terms of how this works. And, and there's a lot of different scenarios that are possible in there within those error bars. And so at the end of the day, you say, well, you know, there's no effect. It's actually maybe gets harmful uh, or, or, you know, as, as the dose gets higher and you don't really know. So what do you do then? You do another study, look for FDA approval, medical account. It's very confusing. So a better way to do this is if you're doing this in a response adaptive randomization way, you're opening and closing different arms to learn more about it. And I'm not going to go through the whole process, but I'll show you what it looks like at the end. Or at the beginning. This is what it looks like at the beginning. So at the beginning, you've got a burn-in rate. So you've got equal numbers getting treated at these three things, and you develop this uh, curve based on simulations with very wide error bars. So you really don't know too much. But as time goes on, this drives randomization to different doses, okay? And in this case, right now, the dose is looking better at 24. So the next iteration, the next 50 patients or so, you might start putting more on 24. You might open up 30 or 36 or whatever what you need to, to answer questions about. But at the end of the day, this is what it's going to look like. So this is a simulation of uh, looking for this dose. And what you can see is instead of having 312, 324, and 348, same number of patients, but we've gotten information from all these different areas. And what we ended up doing is loading most patients up with this because as time went on, this looked like the most effective dose. And what we really did here is we generated a dose response curve with pretty good error bars here. So we can say pretty much that, you know, it looks like what you really want to know is what's the, what's the dose where this finally tails off? What's the highest dose where it tails off? And it looks like it's right around here. So going forward with this information compared to the information I showed earlier, it's just, you know, there's no comparison. So future research, I think a lot of stuff needs to be redesigned. Uh, we need to redesign much of this. I think the preclinical research, and again, there's a lot of this already going on, much closer collaboration with clinical researchers. And I think that a lot of times working together, and I think this is where people like Bob have a real advantage because he's a laboratory researcher who is a clinician. And so he doesn't need to team up with somebody who's a clinician because he is. But a lot of people doing basic science research don't have that. Uh, luxury, and a lot of times there really is a paucity of people who have that clinical knowledge that they're working with. So I think having the clinical researchers working with the basic science researchers could certainly help. Uh, the, we're starting to develop some of these multi-center preclinical trial networks. Uh, the Europeans uh, have one now. 
There are some different ones. I know Bob is working on one of these in cardiac arrest, and there's a few different ones getting started, but they're still few and far between. Preclinical trial networks that use blinding randomization, data analysis, and looking at uh, better designs for some of these studies. Uh, development of ongoing trials with different experimental models. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then I think one of the things we need to do in the preclinical phase too is to test and compare individual agents and combinations of agents in a way that makes sense so we get a better idea of what to take to the clinical arena and we need to do a better job of dose and duration finding. So this is an example from our uh, transformative science grant that we put in. And so this is sort of, you, you can imagine this, that this is a, a never ending phase two preclinical ischemic drug trial. So you've got patients, and maybe you've got animal models with different models of ischemic stroke, okay? And you're interested in looking at uh, drugs A, B, and C. This is placebo. And A, there, A might be a class of drugs. So let's say these are glutamate antagonists, and there might be three glutamate antagonists you're looking at. And B is a different class, and C is a different class. So what you want to do is you want to look at a, B, and C alone. You want to look at A plus B, A plus C, B plus C, A, B, C. You want to do all these things in these different models, and you develop decision rules to say, well, if something either looks futile, it gets dumped, okay, or that arm gets dumped, or if it looks good, it gets bumped, and it gets bumped up to doing clinical trials on that. And then what you do is you take what you've got waiting, and you plug in D. So once you're done and you kick out B or you kick out C or you kick out A, you plug in D and you just go. And what you're doing is developing a much more rational model for trying to figure out what you need to study in the clinical trial phase than what we currently do. I think the phase two process can be informed by more adequate preclinical designs, use of adaptive designs, and what we call platform phase two studies. So we've got one that Will is a PI on right now that we're going to be submitting to NIH in uh, June, hopefully. And this will be the first platform trial that's been designed for stroke. And basically what it is, we were approached by three different people who had neuroprotective agents that they thought would be valuable to give in the ambulance. And each one said, well, do my study, do my study, do my study. And so you know, we talked to them and said, you know, why don't we do something that makes a lot more sense? Why don't we do one study where we evaluate all your agents and we actually compare them with each other? And we do it in a way that says it's actually a futility design. We do it in such a way that says we're going to identify which one of these, if any of them fail, or if all of them fail, and we're going to kick them out. And the one that's left, we're going to be able to predict what's the probability that that agent can work if you go to a phase three trial. And if it's higher than an X probability that it'll work in a phase three trial, it gets kicked out. It gets kicked up to be done in a phase three trial. And if it's less than a certain probability, we kick them out. And so that instead of doing three different trials on three different agents and wasting all that time and money and patience, we're going to be doing comparing three different agents to each other and also to a concurrent placebo group to get an idea of how to move forward with that. So this is a really, it'll be the first time this has been done, which would be really pretty remarkable. Phase three trials, I think we can use adaptive designs in phase three trials as well. You can add exploratory arms with hierarchical modeling. This is something that's really a pretty cool thing to do. Hierarchical modeling is a really interesting thing. So let's say that you've got a, a drug that's a neuroprotective. And so you're going to use it in stroke. But you're also wondering whether it would work in uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. So, you know, hypertensive brain hemorrhage. So you might actually, in this study, look at stroke patients and you're also going to enroll patients with ICH. And what you're going to do is you're going to compare the effects in those two groups by what's called hierarchical modeling. So if you see that there's a beneficial effect in the ICH group and there's a beneficial effect in the stroke group, and it looks that they are very similar in terms of the magnitude of the effects in both of those groups, you can actually pull those groups together and analyze them. If they look very similar, you can actually analyze them as one group and so what you end up doing is instead of having error bars like this, you have error bars like this because you've actually got a larger N that you're studying. And the other thing that tells you is that instead of having to do a separate trial later looking at ICH, you've got a pretty good idea already that this stuff is probably going to work in ICH too because the effects look very similar to what they use and look like in ischemic stroke. 
So that's, that's a really exciting thing. And then I talked earlier about some of the other stuff. The enrichment designs I talked about, about you know, uh, deleting the patients over 70 or some different characteristics like this. And longitudinal modeling is something where you can actually build predictive models. Because sometimes you might be dealing with a um, study where you've got the primary outcome is, isn't until six months. So what do you do if you've got 20 or 30 patients who are only three months out? What you do is you build a model to predict how those patients are going to look, and then you refine it as the study goes on. And some of it's pretty easy, right? If there's somebody who's dead at three months, it's very likely they're going to be dead at six months. If somebody is doing extremely well at three months and they're normal, pretty good bet they're probably going to be normal at six months. And it's the patients in between sometimes you do some predictive modeling to see how they're going to do. And I talked about response adaptive randomization already. And, and you know, basically the main idea is I don't want to miss something that works. I don't want to miss something that works because I did the study wrong. I want to make sure that I'm not going to miss it. So what is the future of neuroprotection? I think that, um, and this is really true, you know, there's a real sense of nihilism regarding neuroprotection. If you look at years ago, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, man, pharma was just coming up with neuroprotective agents to beat the band. There, there was, I was being asked to participate in a neuroprotective trial you know, once every three months or something. Now, hardly any, because they've all failed. And I think pharma's like, I don't know if we really want to go there anymore because most of these things don't work. I think the preclinical and clinical trials uh, testing have had significant shortcomings. Uh, we need a better screening process to identify promising agents and combinations. And we need to redesign our approach to how we evaluate this. And I think that I really do think that we need to consider retesting failed agents uh, using this new approach because some of these failed agents uh, like, like we talked about enteroretrovirals and HIV testing, there's some of these agents that individually may not do much, but you know, if you put terilizad, which is a failed neuroprotective agent, in combination with, you know, inhaled xenon, right, maybe that's going to be a real winner in terms of a combination, but you don't know that because you never evaluated that. So it's, um, you know, I think there's really a lot to be done and, and a lot we have yet to learn, and I'm going to do, you know, whatever I can the time I got left to try to drive this. Unfortunately, we got smart people like Will and others who are gonna keep carrying the message forward. And one of these days, I think we will get this transformative award to look at this stuff, but we'll see. So I'm gonna change, I'm gonna totally change direction here a little bit and talk a little bit about research careers and, uh, and a little bit about my own and just sort of where, where I came from. Um, so the next question is, how do you develop a successful research career? And before I start this, I would like to, is uh, Scott Van Epps here? Yep, Scott's here. And, and I would like to thank Scott and John Younger because John and I gave a talk a few years back at SAM that I'm lifting a lot of the slides and you'll recognize these, Scott, and I do give you credit for it. So there it is. Um, it's a long road to independent funding and John uh, did a study looking at this uh, to try to identify sort of what does what a trajectory look like for a researcher in emergency medicine. And so in, in medicine in general, the time from completion, completion of training to awarding of an R01 has increased substantially, not just for emergency medicine. And the time from completion of residency to receipt of funding uh, can be longer than the time you spent in medical school and residency. If that's not depressing, it probably should be. This hasn't escaped the NIH's notice, and so there's been changes in the ranking system, et cetera, uh, to account for some of this stuff. So there are challenges that come from this because, you know, the trajectory, you're looking at a long-term trajectory, and if you're the chair, which I was for a long time, very long lead time from investment to pay off. So you've got to support somebody and figure out how to keep them going for a long time uh, before they finally get to that place where they become self-sufficient in terms of funding. Sometimes early stars fade. Somebody who looks really, really promising in the beginning might you know, drop off, just lose, lose interest or whatever. And the fraction of faculty going for it is pretty small, potentially very expensive. So, and unfortunately, we don't have this problem here, but in emergency medicine in general, a lot of times chairs of departments haven't actually gone through that themselves. And if they haven't, sometimes they have problems understanding what that means for the individual. For the individual faculty members, a long lead, lead time for sure. Uh, and sometimes you get somewhat isolated from other faculty and departmental activities. Uh, you do have a life outside of work. 
uh, most of us, and sometimes that could threaten by the, the workload. And sometimes you might have to look outside of our field for the best mentorship. Um, so how's the annual performance evaluation going? How should it be going? Uh, John did this interesting study where he polled R01 recipients in emergency medicine. This was a few years back, but I doubt that the data has changed substantially. And he was looking at time to award, publication rate, et cetera, et cetera, and I'll talk about some of these. So age at award, I think this probably shows up. Um, most people you're talking at, they're gonna be over 40, okay? Early 40s, typically. Time from residency to the R01 award, if you see the solid line, that's if you don't do a fellowship, and the dotted line is if you do do a fellowship. And message here we'll talk about later, is that you wanna get awards, doing a fellowship leads to faster awards. You're gonna write a lot of grants, no questions about that, uh, both institutional and external grants over time. And uh, the more you write, uh, usually the, the better you're gonna get at doing it, and the more likely your chance of getting funded. And then there's life work balance during the run up. You know, how much clinical effort have you had in your appointment? How many years have you been married? How many kids do you have? Uh, because life goes on uh, even while you're working towards this. And I think some of the things to shortly, briefly summarize this um, that faculty members and their bosses working towards an R01 should anticipate probably a decade of effort uh, following residency. Most of that time is spent working towards the grant that in medical school and residency combined, and that if you do a fellowship, that your time to funding can be reduced by about five years. Uh, consistently publishing and consistently writing small grants is uh, the way you get to be successful. And uh, life goes on when you're going through this process. And you, you have a life, you got you know, a spouse or significant other, you may have kids and you know, as, Everybody knows here, I mean, I remember when Rebecca was a junior faculty member and, and having her little girls and, you know, the tough, tough process. And I think it's important that, that you know, you have to have somebody kind of helping you out during that period of time too and making sure that you make it through it because uh, those are all important parts of you. Not just your career that's important, obviously, it's what goes on outside of that. So I think this is instructive. I hope this, uh, you know, to me, I, I, it's, it's tough, but it's reality. I think it's one of those things that if you really like doing this, it's worth the effort. And um, I'll talk a little bit now just about my own personal path, and this will be fairly quick. How did I get involved in clinical neuro neurological research? Well, there's some interesting facts that probably some of you don't know. I never did a neurology rotation, ever, <laughs> and still never have. And I really, I absolutely had no interest in stroke when I began doing research. So I was, I was very interested in doing research ever since I was in medical school. And I worked in a cardiac surgery lab and did all kinds of abusive things to animals and putting things inside their hearts and stuff when I was a, when a student. And I knew I wanted to be a researcher when I was going through residency, but um, stroke was not what I wanted to do and I really had not much interest in that. Uh, I've never taken a statistics course, and we talked about this adaptive design. It has a lot to do with statistics. I think the message with some of this stuff is that not that you should do stuff that you don't know anything about or try not to learn anything about. I think the thing is, sometimes I, I talk to people and they think, oh my God, you know, if I'm going to do this research, I probably need to take, you know, get a master's degree and learn biostatistics, and I probably need to do this. And, I, and you know, you some of that stuff can be very helpful depending on where you're going with your career, but you don't need to have advanced degrees in everything to do what you do. You don't have to do a neurology residency to do neurological research. You don't have to have a statistics degree to be participating in statistics. What you need to do is you need to get smart people to work with you, and so that's really what team science is all about, right? Uh, I am not a statistics expert by any means, but Roger Lewis, who we worked with on the Adaptive Design Grant, is, and Don Berry, who is the head of biostatistics at MD Anderson Hospital, is, and so I didn't need to be an expert. All I had to do was know enough that I could understand in basic terms what they were talking about, even though if they said, hey, can you sit down and write the code for the simulations, I would be like, you know, are you kidding? Uh, there's no way I could do that, but I, I could learn to understand the output and what happened with that. And the same thing with uh, neurological things. I'll never be as good as a neurologist in terms of doing neurology, 
and that's why I work with neurologists. But I, I know enough to contribute what, what I can contribute in those. And I started as a laboratory researcher. Yeah, I had no real interest in doing clinical science, and I was working in an animal lab uh, in Cincinnati when I finished my residency. I'm not going to talk anymore about this. This was actually my first article in 1979. Uh, <laughs> So what happened my first 10 years out of residency? Well, from 1979 is when I finished till 1984. I was working in an animal laboratory uh, by myself. The department, had, uh, the department had no laboratory facilities, had no laboratory equipment, had no laboratory budget, had nothing, basically. And so I worked in an animal lab borrowing equipment and expertise and everything from this one woman who ran a cardiology research lab who was extremely helpful in, in, in helping me out to do this stuff. And we were doing things in cardiac arrest and in shock. And actually, the first study that I did, which came from a discussion in the ED, was at the time, uh, and Andy remembers this, I'm sure, and uh, when we had cardiac arrest, uh, you would do intracardiac epi, right? There was, you know. Uh, Pulp fiction style? Huh? Pulp fiction style? You bet. Yeah, yeah. No, the epi syringe came on, you know, it was a pre-filled syringe, came on a needle about that long. And what you did was you went bam, and you put it right in the heart, and that's the way you did it. And, and the thought was, and I remember during an arrest one time, and I was at, talking to the department chair I was working with, I said, well, I said, why do we do this? Well, because, you know, there's no circulation really when you're doing uh, CPR, and if you don't put the drug in the heart, it's never going to get to the heart. I said, really? I said, does anybody know that? He said, I don't know, probably. And so, <laughs> so I looked in the literature, and there was nothing there. And I thought, well, that kind of seems stupid. There's probably some circulation going on. So you know, put together, scraped together a few resources and stuff. And we did a study in the animal lab where we looked at um, you know, basically doing that. So we gave lidocaine, which we gave lidocaine because we could do lidocaine levels. And we did lidocaine in a peripheral IV in, uh, in the experimental animal. And then we also did uh, open chest. So we actually could do cardiac massage to get a very consistent cardiac output, which was much lower than normal, but very consistent. And we didn't have bumpers back there or anything like that. So we, um, so we did that. And we did the lidocaine levels. And we measured the lidocaine levels. And lo and behold, it was pretty darn similar. It was a very short. Add a duration for where it got to the uh, root of the aorta, but basically it worked pretty good. And we did some other follow-up studies on that and some different things. And at the time, there was also some stuff going on with high-dose naloxone, believe it or not. And people were looking at high-dose naloxone for a lot of things, for refractory shock, for um, uh, neurological injury, for spinal cord injury, and for stroke. And so I was really busy doing stuff in there. In the meantime, in 82, I got involved in an industry-funded clinical trial because my chair said, gee, try to do something that you can make some money doing. And so there was a study looking at an agent with pharma. I said, OK, we can do this. So we did. Uh, but that was the first clinical trial I did. And then in 1984, uh, the NIH was interested, NINDS was interested in looking at naloxone, high-dose naloxone in acute stroke. And there was a neurologist at the University of Cincinnati who was a stroke expert who was interested in applying for this uh, RFA. And so he started talking to people in the institution. And he said, hey, is there anybody here who knows anything about naloxone? And I was doing animal studies looking at high doses of naloxone in a model of anaphylactic shock, actually, that I developed. And, and um, they said, yeah, there's this guy in emergency medicine who does stuff with naloxone. So he called me and he said, um, hey, you know, there's this, this RFA from NINDS to do this study looking at high-dose naloxone and acute stroke. So I know plenty about acute stroke. I don't know anything about naloxone. And are you interested? And it was, uh, I'll get to this point a little bit later. So this is one of those things where, remember, I had zero interest in stroke. I could have cared less about neurological outcomes. And, uh, but, you know, it was sort of one of these things you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. And I was like, Hmm, let me see. I'm about four years out of my residency, and somebody's giving me a chance to participate in an NIH grant? Yes, I'll do it. And I got involved with him, and I was a co I on that study, and we followed up by a pharma study for uh, another study uh, in acute stroke. And you know, it's like anything else. Even though I had very little interest in stroke when I started, it's like 
And it's like so many things in medicine, the more I learned about it, the more it was really interesting. And I realized how much we didn't know, and I realized how much there was to do. And I realized, you know, this is something where you could make a huge impact in this area, even though I thought it was kind of silly when I first started. Anyway, we got involved in different things. And the real turning point was with, I think, in 1986, with the uh, NIH TPA pilot studies. And these were the open label studies that were done before the randomized study. And Tom Brott and I were co-principal investigators uh, on that at University of Cincinnati. And we treated our first patient. So this is, next year will be the 30th anniversary of the first patient treated with TPA in a stroke trial in 1987. And things sort of got going from there. And then we had another study looking at ultra-early evaluation of ICH. And this was, again, talking about how research develops into research. And when we were doing the TPA pilot studies, Tom and I were going in and seeing all these patients because it was basically we were the stroke team, the two of us. And we'd come in in the middle of the night and we'd see these stroke patients that came in, you know, 30 or 60 minutes after their stroke started. And we, you know, clinically, you'd look at them and say, well, they look like an ischemic stroke. And we get the CT and they had a hemorrhage. And it was like, wow, that's weird. They don't look like hemorrhage patients. Uh, two hours later, they did look like a hemorrhage patient. And so we were very interested to say, you know what, there's something going on here. And we developed, a, we had a little case series where we had patients whose hemorrhages grew substantially in a short period of time. And so we uh, wrote an R01 to study that and uh, actually showed that, in fact, yeah, hemorrhages grow a lot during the first three hours. And it really led to a lot of the research that's followed in terms of ways to control uh, hemorrhage expansion. And then I was involved in the NDS TPA randomized study as well before I came here. So what went right for me in developing a research career? Uh, I think a couple things, and I think this is something that anybody could take to their own experience. I think, you know, goals. And did I have specific goals? I don't know if I had very specific goals. But I definitely always wanted to do academics, and I always wanted to be involved in research. And I love doing research because, to me, it's a way to leverage knowledge. You know, if I learn how to do something really well, and I'm a good doctor, and I can do some things that are really good, that really only benefits the patients that I see, right? Doesn't benefit anybody beyond that. But if I can look at a new treatment that works, like TPA, and by doing research on people, that you publish that research, you get it out there, and people can, can learn from that, then you leverage everything you've done. And you can put that out to lots and lots of people. Um, you know, if you do it right. I think collaboration, I talked a little bit earlier about team research. I mean, I think especially in emergency medicine, but I think really in almost any field, I mean, team research and collaboration is the way to do it. And you have to find the right, whoops, you have to find the right people to work with uh, who fill in your gaps. And that's what I've usually tried to do when I look at research teams is who knows something that I don't? Right? And I want to work with people who can do stuff that I can't do because I can do what I can do, right? I don't need anybody else to do what I can do. I need somebody who can do what I can't. So surrounding yourself with people who are complementary to you in terms of not only their knowledge, but sometimes what they like to do. I am not a detail person myself. I'm not you know, a micromanager. But God knows you need to manage details if you're doing clinical research. So I make sure. I've got people I work with who are really good at managing the details because that isn't what I like to do and I'm not good at doing that. So look at a collaboration with people and finding people who complement your skills I think is really a key thing. You know, mentors, uh, got it. Mentors I think is a, this is the last slide, a really important thing. And I've had plenty of them from the first guy I talked about, the neurologist, uh, Chick Olinger, who took me on years ago and, um, and helped me out to Richard Levy, who was my chair at uh, Cincinnati, uh, and Laser Greenfield here in surgery, who was a really wonderful help and very supportive for us going along. But everybody needs those. And I think pursuing opportunities. And I think that, you know, um, a lot, I, I think I benefited very much from being in the right place at the right time. But sometimes being in the right place at the right time is a conscious decision, too. And so I think you can create opportunities for yourself by realizing where there might be opportunities. And then perseverance. You just got to keep going at it and going at it and going at it. And, um, and you write and you write and you write and you keep banging on the door and the door eventually does open, <laughs> believe it or not, but you just have to keep banging away at it. Um, so that is, I think, about all 
I had to say, I'm just going to end by saying again, thank you to Bob for, for this honor, for this research day. And I just, I can tell you that uh, he mentioned something about Bill recruiting me. I, I did recruit him. You know, we, I talked to Bob when we first started the search process. And uh, at that time, it wasn't a good time for him. And there were things going on. He said, no, nah, you really can't apply for this job right now. So we went through a few other candidates, and things didn't work out. And um, I talked to the dean, and I said, you know, you can let the search committee go at this, but do you care if I go out and try to do my own recruiting? He said, no, that's fine. So I called Bob again. <laughs> I said, Bob, two years later, where are you at now? And he was like, well, you know, I think things are looking a little bit different. And, um, and I was thrilled. And I'll tell you, it's a real pleasure for me because I, I, you know, we did a lot to build up this department and stuff like this. And I really wanted someone to come in and take over this department who was going to not just kind of make sure we didn't go down, but somebody who was going to take things to a new level. And, I, and Bob is clearly doing that. So I, I mean, I want to thank you for, for that. And I want to thank you for taking this department to a new and better place than I ever envisioned. And, um, and thanks, everybody, for, for all your help and support over the years. Thank you.